Father, we worship. Father, we bless you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' precious name we've prayed. Amen. Quickly open your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Luke 11, verse 1. I'll read from verse 1. Do more, you help me. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. All right? Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, when he ceased praying, or when he finished praying, yes, one of his disciples said unto one him, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray, teach us to pray, as John also as taught, John his disciples. taught his disciples to pray. So let me quickly put a little bit of light on that. We've shared on prayer for the past three weeks. We need to understand how critical this is. The least attended activity in the body of Christ is prayer. And when I mean prayer, I don't mean the kind of morning prayers we do on our prayer platforms all over the world. That's fantastic. But there's a serious deficiency in the health of the personal prayer life of most believers. If you ask most believers, they don't have a prayer life. They don't have a prayer life. They don't have people seeing them pray. The disciples of Jesus saw him pray. Do you have people seeing you pray? Praying all by yourself. The Bible says they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. You see, Jesus Christ had a prayer life. He had a prayer time. Jesus had a time that he prayed. The Bible says early in the morning, before dawn, Jesus would wake up and go to a place to pray. Do you have a prayer time? Do you have a time that if I call you, I'm sure you'll be praying? When last did someone call you or ask of you and they say, don't worry, he can't answer your call now. He is praying. Or she is praying. Jesus had a prayer life. He had a prayer life. And disciples walked up to him. They said, teach us. Follow me closely. Teach us to pray. Now, prayer was not the only thing Jesus did. Jesus preached the gospel. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus cleansed the lepers. The disciples didn't ask him to teach them how to preach the gospel. There was no place in the scriptures where the disciples told Jesus to teach them how to heal the sick. The only thing they told Jesus to teach them was how to pray. Because they observed him that this man's life is powered by his prayer life. Even if we can preach now, if we can learn how to pray like he prays, we will preach like he preaches. Even if you can heal the sick now, if you can learn how he prays, the Bible says, the Acts him, teach us. If you learn how to pray, we will learn how to heal the sick. Everything you see in the life of Jesus was powered by his prayer life. What I say next? Give me verse 2. And he said unto he them, said unto them when, you pray, when you pray, say, say. you see that? When you pray, to teach them how to pray, they have to pray. The best way to learn how to pray is to do what? To pray. I can give you principles on prayer. I can give you precepts on prayer. I can give you signs and signposts on prayer. Until you put your knees on the ground and you begin to pray, you never learn how to pray. Now, we've spent the last three weeks learning how to pray. If you really have not started praying, you have learned nothing. Prayer is a practice. Prayer has to be learned. Prayer is a practice. Prayer has to be re -asked. You have to master the art of prayer. The more you pray, the better you are at praying. The more you stay in God's presence, the easier it is for his presence to fill the room when you come in. The more you pray, the better you are at it. Jesus was a man of prayer. You know, I was watching one Apostle Babalola's, you know, documentary this week. I'm not even Apostle Babalola, the CAC prayer man. And you know, in that, in that video, they were saying how he was dying and they were calling him Baba Dua. Baba Dua, Baba Dua, Baba Dua. So, and I, and I started to ponder that. They call Apostle Babalola Baba Dua. Baba Dua means the man of prayer. That, do people around me think I'm a man of prayer? If I were dying, would they say Baba Dua, Baba Dua, Baba Dua? Would they wake me up like that? Would I be referred to as a man of prayer? Am I praying enough? James chapter 5, help me, verse 16. Am I praying enough? As a believer, am I spending enough time before God in prayer? What does it say? Uh, James chapter 5, verse 16. Yes. One to another. Yes. And pray for one another. Pray for, yes. That ye may be healed. Yes. 
It says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man, yes? Avails much. Avails much, yes? Elias was a man. Elias was a man. Follow me closely. Elias is the New Testament way of pronouncing Elijah. Elijah was a man. The Bible says he did what? Subject to like passion. He's subject to like passion that we are. And he prayed. So they were going to describe Elijah. Follow me closely. They said he prayed. Elijah was a man of like passions. What does the meaning of like passions mean? Give me NLT for like passion. What does NLT say? What does the meaning of like passions? Elijah was a man of like passions as we were. What does like passion mean? NLT, what does NLT say? As human as we, we are. He is as human as we are. That means he has the human limitations that we may have. We get tired when we pray. We get tired. We have bodily weakness. Elijah was a man like that. The Bible says Elias was a man and he prayed that there would be no rain. And there was no rain. Elijah was a man. I had preached an entire sermon on this before. Elijah was a man. So write it, number one, Elijah was a man. Put it down. Number one, Elijah was a man. Put an emphasis on the man. Elijah was a man. Put your emphasis on the man. Because we ask all the time, where is the God of Elijah? The truth is that the God of Elijah is on his throne. The problem is that where are the Elijahs of God? Elijah was a man. The scripture was very clear that Elijah was not a spirit. Elijah was not an angel. Elijah was not anything supernatural in the physical. Elijah was a man born by a man and a woman. Elijah was as human as we are. He was tempted like we were. He had the limitations that we had. The Bible says he prayed in spite of that. That means you have no excuse in your life not to have a prayer life. No excuse. No excuse. Some of us have flimsy excuses. I was telling my friend, I said everything I prayed about that I, was, I wish I had, that if I had, I'll be, able to, I'll be able to have a better prayer life. I have everything now. Everything I prayed about. One of the things I prayed about, I said, Lord, if only you can give me a private place to myself. The reason why I'm not praying is that I need a secret place. I don't know what I'm talking about. A prayer room. Amen. It's not I'm spotting with all these people. They are making too much noise. I just need a place all by myself. Oh, man. How many of you feel like that? How many of you think you're going to be able to pray more if you have a place all just by yourself? Only you. How many of you think you're going to be able to pray better if only you have airports? I know people that said they couldn't pray. This is why they couldn't pray. Is that they, 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 need, they need an airport to be able to be listening to sermon. That that's what they need. If they, can, if, they only, if they only can have an airport. If only I can have an airport, that's what I need. I need a phone that can play sermons. This is my phone does not allow me to pray well. Elijah had no phone. Elijah had no airport. I've had a flimsy excuse. Some people said that they'll be able to pray if only they had TBN. If you had DSTV, if I had DSTV in my house, I'd be able to be watching Christian, Christian. You have had TV now, what are you watching? Big Brother Ninja. <laughs> so long as you keep attaching your prayer life to the accomplishment of something, you will never pray. So I'm saying, if only, so in this my estate, our road is not good. I want an estate where I can be walking in the night and be praying. That's where I want. If only I can get, that's, you are looking for excuses. There is none of the things I prayed for that I thought if I had, I would have a better prayer life that I don't have today. And none of them made me pray better. I had to make up my mind to pray. Elijah was a man. Was not a spirit. As we are seated here today, there is nothing Elijah had that you don't have. As we are seated here, there is nothing that made Elijah Elijah that you didn't have the possibility of becoming yourself. Elijah was a man. Let it ring in your mind that you don't need more than you already have. When Elijah stood on Mount Carmel that day, he didn't have to build a new altar. He repaired the broken altar. Fire would come down on a broken altar that is repaired. Hallelujah. Amen. Elijah was a man. Number two, right again, Elijah was. Put the emphasis on A. Capital letter A. The first one was the capital letter man. The second one is capital letter A. Elijah was A, was not a group. Elijah was not a committee. Elijah was not a prayer team. 
One man shook the curtains of heaven over a nation. One man. One man with God is a majority. One man. If God finds, you see, we have heard about when God handles a man. We have not heard enough about when a man handles God. Elijah was one man, one man against 960 prophets of power. One man. See, the reason I cannot pray is that I don't have a group. We, we are not much. Only is enough. Moses was one man. Someone say one man. Moses, one man, went to Israel, went to Egypt and released over 3 million slaves. Slaves that have been in servitude for over 400 years. One man. One man. One man. David was one man, faced Goliath. One man. It's a mystery of one man. Sometimes the fact that we keep asking for excuses, keep looking for excuses, the reason why we cannot make progress where we are. Start from where you are. Start with who you are. Start where you are. You don't need a crowd. One man. When God finds one man, Ezekiel 22 verse 30, he says, I sought for a man among them. A man. One man. One man is enough to shake the foundations of the enemy on your family. One man. If God finds one man in your family, you will set the family loose. Jephthah was one man. Gideon was one man. Gideon, one man. You don't need a crowd. See my prayer. You don't, you alone. When you go down on your knees, I heard that the Queen of England said if she feared the prayer of John Knox that the entire army of England, one man, shook the earth. One man. The, so long as you keep looking for excuses, you'll find it. One man. David, one man, first Goliath. Moses, one man, first Pharaoh. Someone say, I'm a one man. Jesus was one man. One man. We don't need a team. We don't need a committee. You alone with Jesus are a majority. Noah was one man. Abraham was one man. Look through scripture. Everyone God moved. He didn't move a group. Has he ever seen God move a group? Who does he call? One man. It comes to one man to call him. So your emphasis is on A. Elijah was A. Now the third emphasis is on was. Elijah was. Capital letter was. Elijah was a man. What that means is that as powerful as Elijah was, as anointed as Elijah was, as great as his ministry was, his ministry is a was. He's dead and gone. Now it's your turn. Elijah is past tense. Past tense he is. We all know the men of God that have died and gone, but they are dead and gone. What are you going to do differently? You know, I was in Benin for the first time. When I landed in the airport, one of the pastors came and picked up, up from the airport, my wife and I, and they said, that's the, that's the, that's the church of Archbishop, Archbishop Benson Daouza. I could see from the airport. I said, what? I said, take me there now. So we got there. When I got there, where he was buried, I quickly went there. And I began to pray. I began to pray. I began to pray. And the Lord says, Philip, I said, yes, Lord. He said, I know you honor Archbishop. I said, but he's dead. What are you going to do? Do you think he stayed in somebody's grave and kept praying like this? Catherine Kuman is anointed, but she's dead. Alexander Doug is anointed, but he's dead. Or Robert was anointed, but he's dead. Apostle Babala was anointed, but he's dead. All the great men that ever lived and dead are dead. Now is your turn. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now arise. Are we going to spend all our time fixated on the stories that we've read about and never do anything with our lives? Elijah was powerful. Elijah was anointed. But yes, Elijah is dead. Elijah prayed, the scripture says. Am I praying enough? Man is God's method. Elijah was God's method. Man is God's child. I told you, God's focus is always on the man. God's focus is always on the man. The man is praying that things will change, but God is focusing on the man that the man will change. Every time you come before God, it is you that he focuses on. It works on your patience. It works on your long suffering. You become changed as you stay in God's presence. I'm telling you the truth. It is having a personal prayer life that changes a man. It's having a place where God can speak to him, speak to his life. If you're going to marry someone that doesn't have a prayer life, you're marrying a devil. It can be anything. It's only a man that has had God or is hearing God that is better to marry or a woman 
You know what my wife told me? As much as it sounds like it's a serious thing, it looks like a compliment. He said, Philip, you know you don't do anything for me in this house. I said, God says you to do it. <laughs> Say, you don't do anything. I said, no, no, I love you. He said, it's a lie. I've been married to you for 10 years now. You have never done anything that you didn't say God told me to do it. That if I want something, if I want something, until God tells you. Now, it looks like that's a, like it's a, eh? Like what? I didn't get you. Yeah, it shades me, but it's a compliment. Let me tell you it's a compliment. Let me tell you it's a compliment. What that means is that she can go and relax. She knows that I will always listen to God. Are you following me? There are people that don't listen to God. They don't fear man, they don't fear God, and they don't fear devil. Now, if I am going out of my way and she can show me a scripture, she knows that so long as she can show me a scripture, I will align my life to the scripture. She knows. She knows that if no matter what I'm saying, just get him a scripture, just show him. This is what the Bible says. I will change. There are people that are dating people that don't even know the Bible. Talking of telling them what the Bible says. So how will you hear the man of God? I told you the story about how I wanted to go and pray. And I was going to go and pray. And God told me, go back. Go back. What if I didn't have a hearing for God? God focuses on the man. That is why no matter what you are dating now, you better date someone that can hear God. <laughs> date someone. Are you following my point? You know, <laughs> people that are fornicating, they are fornicating without restriction. Now, they are married, their relationship now want to scatter. They now came and met me. You that you have been sleeping with each other. And it's because you have been sleeping with each other that blood your senses. You did not honor God in your relationship. You now came to me for cancer. You better get out of my presence. Because when you were doing it, are you following my point? When you were doing it, you did not remember God. Now that your relationship wants to scatter, you are looking for godly cancer. Godly cancer for what? Did you obey God's word? Do you have, are you going, you know, you are going, somebody, some people, some people, God knows, even God knows in this, in church, not in this church, you're not in this church. God knows that they have problem with this thing and give them a sister that will say, no, brother, we cannot do it until marriage. And those Christian brothers, Christian brothers will break up with a Christian sister because the Christian sister did not agree to have sex with him. Christian, Christian. Christian, you are a Christian sister. Your body cannot stay one place. Then God gives you a, gives you a brother that is disciplined because God wants to control your life. But because He will not shift your pants, you broke up. You are a Christian, no? So when two people that will not honor God's word get married, they have gotten married on the wrong foundation. Fornication is the nursery. To adultery. If you did not stop fornication in marriage, in premarital relationship, you cannot argue against adultery. Adultery is the graduated, if you like, frank your face. <laughs> adultery is the graduated portion of. So long as you agree that fornication went on, when you marry, you people you have, you, have, you, have, you can do as you like because you do not obey God. Even the man can go out and sleep with a goat. So long as you were fornicating, are you following my points? So long as you are fornicating, you have allowed Satan to take over your relationship. When you get married, if Satan is your Lord, you cannot use a, you cannot use Bible to correct a child. You didn't use Bible to raise. You cannot use Bible to correct a marriage. You didn't use Bible to arrange. But if you start with devil, you must finish with devil. If a man does not have a prayer altar, where will God speak to him? God will not do anything until he has found a man. I showed you that in Mark chapter 3 verse 7. He will not do anything until he has found a man to do it. That's why God needs people to pray. Until he has found someone to pray, he will not do anything. God will not do anything until he has found someone to pray. 
you will not do it just as far someone to tell it to, someone to pray through, or someone to do it through. God will not do anything until he has found someone to pray. God will not do anything until he has found someone to pray. The call to prayer is our first call as Christians. No matter what call or assignment is on your life, the call to prayer is the first one. God has called you to ministry, the first step is to pray. God has called you to have, to have an NGO, the first thing is to pray. The God has called you to do anything God has called you to do. Somebody is flank his face, I don't care. God has called you to do it. Oh God. You know, you know, I've been married to my wife for almost 11 years now, and she's a marriage therapist. I said she used to counsel a lot of people for marriage. If people listen to God's word, there will be no need for most of this postmarital counseling. You see, if you open 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, alone, if you obey 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you, it will cancel over 95% of most of the counseling that we are doing. It's because people are not willing to listen to the Holy Spirit that God has given to them, that they are running up and down. They know what they want to do. Some of them even already know what they want to do, but they are looking for someone that would have found what they want to do. So they will be going up and down. And there are some relationships that I know that this relationship, if two of them go, I'm a very blunt person, I know that this relationship cannot work. You see that if two of them have that same mindset, if two of them come, it cannot work. So if I talk the way I'm talking, it's not because I'm talking because I want. No, it's because I'm talking after 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 years of experiencing so many relationship issues, and people if people don't obey God's word from the beginning. It will be difficult to choose God's word in the middle. All right, we need to pray. We need to pray. We are where we are today because of the prayers we prayed yesterday. If you don't pray today, we we'll have nowhere to be tomorrow. We are, where we, are today, for me. we are where we are today because of the prayers we prayed yesterday. If you didn't pray yesterday, we have nothing to walk in today. If you didn't pray today, we have nothing to walk in tomorrow. I can remember vividly when I was on campus. Some of the things that we are seeing today, I pray them out on campus. If you are a single person, this is the time to invest more time in prayer. When I was on campus, we have sports center. I don't know if you have sports centers when you're in university. Sports centers. Let me see hands. Sports centers. I don't know if you pray in your sports center. Yeah. If you go to Bafima Law University, you see people praying there. People praying there. People praying there. If you go to the University of Ibadan, you see people praying there. So all the things that we are seeing today, we prayed them yesterday. They are like seeds that are now growing to harvest. If we don't plant today, we will have nothing to reap tomorrow. We must pray today. We must pray today to reap tomorrow. And our problem is not consistency, even though we have to pray consistently. So if you ask somebody, why are you, why are you not praying? He says, because I, can, I, have, I have a problem with consistency. How many of you have a problem with consistency? Nobody has a problem with consistency. Nobody here. Nobody has a problem with consistency. All of us, none of us have a problem with consistency. Bobby, some of us have woken up every morning for the past two years and checked our phone first, consistently. Are you following my point? Are you following me? Some of us have followed a particular series, Avengers. Consistently. Suppose I follow up a particular reality show. Consistently. You see my point? Our challenge is not consistency. The challenge is that what you are doing consistently is this thing moving you closer to your desired destiny. That's where the question is. So having a consistent prayer life is not a challenge if we will be ready to channel our already consistency that we already have into it. Number one, I must have a strong desire. Write that down. I'm closing up. I'm just trying to wrap this up because this, this is our final day. We must have a strong, I must have a strong desire for a prayer life. A strong desire for a prayer life. We are as full of prayer as we want to. I must have a strong desire. A strong desire. Yoruba people have a, a the, the meaning desire in Yoruba has a very loaded meaning. Desire. It's what you have loaded in your chest. What have you loaded in your chest? What is your desire? So it becomes a strong desire because you loaded it in your chest. If I come and meet you in the afternoon, you are talking about it. Meet you in the morning, you are talking about it. You want to have a strong, it must be a strong desire in your heart. So long as it's a casual thing, it happens when it happens, it will never grow. How do I grow desire? Number one, I must read, I must read books. Number one, to grow desire, I must read books. Books of people who walked in prayer. 
I must read books. Our generation does not know how to read. I don't think we'll be able to produce any William Shakespeare in this generation. We don't like books. We can read blogs. We can read gossips. The gossip that came out yesterday. They, some, people, some people now, they can tell you everything that happened. That's why I say I don't have time for any gossip right now. Some people can tell you how the year it started. They can. So it's not like we have, it's not like we don't have a heart for research. It's that we are researching nonsense. Some people can tell you in details when that thing started, when it when, when, so people, by now some people already have the picture that those people snapped. They have gone to the internet, you have you have softened, you have gotten everything. The tendency to know what does not concern you is very serious. Some of us safe are not even happy that by now we have not gotten more updates. Are you following my point? So we don't read books that would help us. I remember when we were younger, younger Christians on campus, we read all the books we could find. I bought Maxwell Leadership Bible. Maxwell Leadership, I will never forget. My monthly allowance was 5,000 era. 5,000 era my parents gave to me when I was on campus. My father was dead, my mother was dead, so it was what we could scramble around. We got 5K every month. I paid my tithes 500 naira. I had four, five left. I bought that Maxwell Leadership Bible, 3,600 naira. I will never forget, I still have it till now. I drank the gari that month. But I was happy. I kissed it when I bought it. I loved it. I bought Maxwell Leadership and book, big book like this. I still have it. I bought it 1,650. I remembered. I read those books. If you come into our library, we have over a thousand personal books in our personal library. Over a thousand books. My wife buys books in bundles. He orders books in bundles. I enter a book, it's an addiction. I enter a book, I buy everything I can see. And I sit down and I begin to read. You think I'm doing PhD? I've never passed up before in my life. How am I passing church like this? Zero experience. I read pastoring like PhD. I sat down and I began to read. There are people here, you have left university every time. You have not read one book on what you are doing. What you know is what they taught you from 1977. Everybody has moved ahead. You are reading nothing except jargons. Sit down and read. And every day, technology is coming up with easier ways to be lazy. I'm telling you the truth. This thing, what they, I always miss that thing. Chat, chat, what? So you have a, an app now that can write, that can write your, write your projects for you. You don't even have to think. A generation is getting lazier and lazier and lazier. We read Charles Spurgeon. We read Charles G. Finney. We read Kenneth Hagin. Every book Kenneth Hagin wrote. Every book he wrote. We read it. You buy it. When you talk, when we talk, when we talk with each other, what we shared was the books we were reading. When I met my friend on the road, his books, Omo, which book? I just got this book. Would you, would you, which, his books. We read books every time. And that's how our minds were working. Sometimes when you hear some people speak now, they are very shallow. Very shallow. You know this person has no thoughts. And they have not been reading. It shows, it shows. It doesn't take long before it starts to you not been reading anything. If you try to engage a believer now, some of them, they don't even want to think. Say, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. You swear. Say, tell me what you know about global warming. I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. <laughs> and that one consign me. That one, that one change price of Gary for markets. <laughs> Not ready to learn anything. Young people with daft minds. Not ready to learn anything. Are you following my point? You must, to, to inspire, to inspire hunger in your heart, you must sit down and read. I read the book, The Purpose of Pentecost, T.L. Osborne. I bought it 16 naira. I was in my office. T.L. Osborne. Every book I had, Bishop Oedeko say, I buy it. If you go is preaching and he says, hey, I read the book, I will go and look for that book. I will go and look for every book he ever mentioned in any of his sermons, I will go and read it. I can say categorically that I've read every book that Oedeko mentioned in any of his sermons that I know. Any book. 16 naira. That guy said, where's the anointing? That the church needs the anointing. The church needs the anointing. Purpose of, that the, purpose of, the purpose of the Holy Ghost is not praying in tongues. Papa says he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost came upon you. Is that what it says? It is he shall speak in tongues. So the speaking in tongues is an indicator of the Holy Ghost, not the purpose of the Holy Ghost. The power is the purpose of the Holy Ghost. Hey, I read that book. I was bubbling in my office. I tapped my friend. I said there's need for power in the church. The church is powerless. 
As I was saying that, my phone rang. I picked it, my friend. He said, Philip, my mom just slumped. We are rushing out to the hospital. I caught it. I said, hey, what do I do? I was saying, you are the one that was saying that trust needs power. This is an opportunity for you. So I called her back. Hey, so what do you do now? Where are you going? She says, she's going to um, OUTH. That they are rushing out there like that. She's unconscious. I said, okay, you know what? I'm in the office now. When I finish, I'll come and meet you. God says, as I was meeting, God was telling me, no, you can't go and meet her. You have a, meet, you have a meeting this evening. I said, so what do I do? God said, tell her to come to your office, pray on an anchor chief. Let her go and lay that anchor chief on her mom. I said, God, it's stroke. Oh. <laughs> it's not a, maybe you think, maybe, it's, maybe, talk, maybe say, you thought they say cough. It's stroke. This woman is of course, her blood pressure was reading 220, 220, 230. Hi. God says, I said, when she comes, pray on an anchor chief, give it to her. So I said, hey, I said, you know what? Be coming to my office now. I'll pray on an anchor chief and give it to you. When she, was, when she came, I, I picked up an handkerchief, laid hands on it like this. I said, Father, I ask that every healing anointing on my life. You see, I am under the influence of that book I just read. It's intoxicating me. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be ye drunk of the Holy Ghost. Ha-ha! I was drunk. I prayed over the handkerchief. I said, take it to your mom. When I gave her the handkerchief like this, as she was going like this, I wanted to go and pray. God said, hey, where are you going? I said, I want to go and pray. Don't go and pray about what? You know, because I didn't believe in that prayer that I just prayed. I thought I needed to. I was looking at the enormity of the problem to rate the enormity of God's power. And everything is small before God. Small prayer can do anything. When you have developed authenticity and power in the place of prayer, you will not need long prayers publicly. This public long prayer you are praised because you have a very weak private prayer life. So God says, if you pray this prayer that you want to pray now, this is your prayer of fear will destroy that your prayer of faith. So I said, okay, okay, no problem, Lord. Yes, Lord. How, how, we thank you, Jesus. I woke up in the night. Hey, say, this is my team. I've died by now. I said, let me just keep praying. Father, we thank you. I, want to, I said, God, you are the one that didn't allow me to pray. Oh. You know, I want to pray. Oh. Hey. In the morning, she called me on the phone. Pastor Philip. I said, what happened? See, my mom is at home. I said, tell me. She said, when I got there, I put the, because the doctors already told us that if she woke up from this unconsciousness, she will wake up into a stroke. She said, when I dropped the handkerchief on her body, the blood pressure dropped to 120. Before the eyes, she woke up. She was discharged immediately. They collected back all the drugs they gave to her. So the mommy now put the handkerchief by her heart like this. She said, mommy, let me just be going. Where did that thing come from? From a book. I read a book that spoiled my heart. I read a book that seared my faith. Child of God, your prayerlessness can be connected to the fact that you don't study anything. When you sit down with the books of men who prayed, sit down with books of E.M. Bounds. Do you know E.M. Bounds? Do you know Levin, Levin, Levin Hill? Leonard Levin Hill. Men who wrote volumes on prayer. Whereas they do well, a blessed for God. You see, you don't know those books. You know what that guy's, that person. Gossip or saying, just love. You know that one. There's a book called God Lovers. Go for God Lovers, don't go for Just Lovers. God chase us. Have you read God chase us? Have you read God chase us? How do you know that God chase us? What's the name of that guy? Uh, A.W. 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 Sosa wrote God. No, no, A.W. Sosa. God chase us was written by someone else. Not A.W. Sosa. Who wrote it? God chase us. Help me do more. God chase us. God chase us. I bless for God. What's the duel? There were books that would trigger prayer in your life. You see, when you finish reading those books, you want to pray everywhere. Everywhere you're going, you are praying. When you meet people who have been praying, you will know. It exudes in their life. We pray together. I told you the story before. That when the fire of God came on me for prayer, I'd gone to pray in the sports center. And I don't usually pray for more than 10 minutes. All my prayer. After I pray for global warming. After I pray for Africa, pray for US, pray for Russia, pray for Sweden. After I'm done praying for my entire family, I look at the time, it's 10 minutes. I couldn't pray beyond 10 minutes. I couldn't pray beyond 10 minutes. God bless my family. Everybody, 10 minutes. But that day I got to pray that morning. And there was a lady in that prayer court. Shekatelebande, Eklo, Blos, Kufle, Kebeledi, Kabata, Engrada. She was just changing the J. In the Dedi Atosa, Ekaradabaha, Embarada, Shila, Kebradoki. 
She was enjoying the Lord. You see, she would roll and bask. I was done with my 10 minutes prayer. I was about to go. Something said, oh boy. You met this lady here now. How will you leave her here? I said, no. I'm a man. Men are leaders. Man is the head. I cannot meet this woman here and leave her here. So I turned back. Ekatalabada. Hembloku, one hour. Indogododoboka. Kembre, Zufre, Taliba, two hours. This lady wasn't going to stop praying. I was going to go and tap her sister. Are you not done with your prayer? I can't go except you leave. I stay there three hours. Hey, this is that we not stop. Oh. She kept changing the day. You know she was not praying for her needs. She had found her lover. You see, when you are praying for needs, how many needs do you have? You'll be done in 30 minutes. But when you begin to pray for four hours, you know this is beyond need. This is life. This is death. This is intimacy. I prayed and prayed. That day, until the fire of God fell on me. It fell on me, I knew I'd broken through because of that fire on that system. Read books, it will show. Second, listen to tapes. Listen to CDs. Listen to sermons on prayer. Look for sermons on prayer. This entire series. Go and get everything free of charge on YouTube. Go and listen over and over and over and over again. Listen to sermons. Some people, they never listen. The moment they are done on Sunday, they are gone. Never come back again. Never come back again. Oh, the sermons that we talked in this church. Someone sent me a picture of us. I think our friends in the US sent me a picture. This guy says he went to download all our sermons and that he's in a retreat right now. I can't even stay at home. He said, I don't know that guy before. I just found him. I just stumbled on him. I said, There are people who are here. They're seeing me every day. <laughs> Let those things trigger in you. Faith. You are hearing stories. Where will your own come? Every day, under person, under person, under person. When will you hear about your own story? Are you not a Christian? Don't you have the Holy Ghost? Why are you like that? Why is your own case just like this? Just natural life, just normal life. Anything, it's like chicken pox, leprosy, pox, everything. It's backache, stomach pain, no snake. Everything just happened to you anyhow. And you're a Christian. Listen to tapes. I told you what broke the bands of sickness on my life was Bishop Edebo's five power buttons of total health. I listened to it over a hundred times. Over and over. Listen to it over and over. Over and over. Have a playlist of worship music that you pray over. Sometimes you don't even know what to pray. You just want to spend time. You don't have to pray because you have something to pray. Pray because you need to pray. So you don't have a prayer point. You have a playlist. This playlist. You have this song, Two White Bellows Fire. About one hour. One hour. Play it like this. Kepa, Pakra, Pakos, Kepra. Your mind would think of rice, you bring it back. Mesco, Prate. Your mind would think, you bring it back. Your mind would be distracted for over 20 times, you bring it back. A playlist. A sermon is averaging one hour. That's a sermon. So if you listen to three sermons, that's three hours. So when I'm playing a sermon on my, that is the purpose of those your phones, not what you're doing with it. That you're doing is rubbish. That's the purpose of your phone. I have a YouTube and I'm listening to a song list and I'm listening for three hours. I can pray over it. Because Bible says when you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. So I engage my mind by listening to that sermon and I engage my spirit by praying in tongues. I pray like nothing else. I pray, I pray over it. I don't even have to shout. In my room, I am I'm mostly strength. Ah, too many prayerlessness everywhere. When we're on campus, we woke ourselves up with our prayer. My alarm clock, you know what my alarm clock says? I recognize my voice. By myself, that's my alarm. Ah, Philip, wake up! It's time to pray. Destiny is waiting, you are sleeping. He covered another. That's my alarm clock. I said to myself. So when I, I wake up to the consciousness of my own voice in tongues, you set yourself to it. It doesn't happen naturally. Nobody grows up naturally. You grow old by nature. You grow up by intention. Nobody grows up. Things don't happen. Good things don't happen naturally. Even flower. If you plant flower, you see weeds growing naturally. The one that you are watering will not grow. You know, who is watering these weeds? It's Satan. I was where men slept. Then we came and do what? Sotas. You listen to CDs. Listen to tapes. Go back. In those days, we had those rechargeable lamp. You know those rechargeable lamp? Red like this. I'm not even know what I'm talking about. Red with lamp. This Gen Z. No, no, this thing. Lamp like this. 
the cassette player. You roll it with Bairo. Rewind. You rewind. How many of you know what talking about? And there's a lamp. So as you are praying, you have lights to write. Yesterday morning, I woke up at about 5 o'clock. I listened to one post pastor produce, pastor produce message. One. 5 o'clock. I listened to it one. Only one sermon. I listened to it like 10 a.m. For like five hours. I did not finish it. Because I was stopping. Right? Stopping. Right? Stopping. Rewind. Stopping. Right? Stopping. Rewind. 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 That's how we used to rewind. Say, rewind. The tape will cut. You remove it. You use cello tape to cello tape. You put it back. You rewind. And that's how you build strength in the spirit. Not all this thing we are doing today. God has called you to a prophetic and prophetic look at you. Prophetic ministry. You know. Inside you. There is a prophetic ministry, but you cannot pray it out. You have become lazy and sleepy. Things slip out of your hands when you sleep. You have become lazy. Look at you. There's a destiny waiting. You know it. They told you when you're young. There is an anointing on your life. There's a call on your life. They told you. But there's nothing showing. You know, you know, you know. It's not you. You know that there's something on your life. But your prayerlessness keeps you asleep. And then it's sleeping on you. Wake up, child of God. Wake up. It's time to pray. It's time to pray. You're sleeping. It's time to pray. Destiny is coming. What is, is the answer to everything? Why am I always fearful? I wish your prayer life. Why am I lazy? I wish your prayer life. Why am I always anxious? I wish your prayer life. Why is this not working? I wish your prayer life. I wish your prayer life is the immediate question. To every, 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 every situation, that's the question. How is your prayer life? Things are not working. How is your prayer life? We birth things in the spirit. But as a mother, Paul says, I, I labor again. In birth, I pray in birth. Look at you, child of God. You are more than this. Way more. You know. It's not like I'm, as I'm talking now, your mind, your heart is crazy. You say, what then? You are the one they are talking about. This would have been better, but you will not pray. The enemy will not stop. He picked up James, cut off his head, picked up Peter. After the church began to pray, the church began to pray. They picked up Paul, threw him. How will you keep Paul? What can kill a man like Paul? How will you keep him? Listen, how can you keep him? Paul? How will you kill him? Paul said, I pray in tongues when I yield. He told an entire church. I pray in tongues when I yield. He said it, he wrote it down, so that nobody will forget. So that the can know that I pray in tongues. They stoned him, he woke up. She prayed, he woke up. Viper bites him, he woke up. He did not, he shook, he didn't, he said, Jesus! Blood of Jesus! He was an energized man. Paul was a man of prayer. He said, I will pray in the spirit and I will pray my understanding also. He was a man of the place of prayer. Paul cannot die. Say, God, let us have. Paul does not pray for long life. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, he was telling them that, hey, I have two options now. Whether I should die or I should stay back. Hmm. Hey, if I should die now, after all, to be absent in the body, he said, I would love to go and meet Jesus. I want to be with him. I love the Lord Jesus. He says, so if I die now, I will go. He said, but if I wait, I'll be around for you people to teach you. I said, okay, you know what? Let me wait. He said, God's time is the best. God's time is the best. Paul's time is the best. He picked his own time. He told Timothy, I am now ready to be offered. He told Timothy like that. He said, my, wine, my life is like the wine poured forth. He said, I am now ready. He told Timothy, I am now ready to die. If he was not ready, no Jupiter could keep her. Nobody could keep her. They beat him. He didn't die. Shipwreck, he didn't die. Ham robbers, he didn't die. Viper, he didn't die. Stone, they stoned him to death. He woke up, he shook himself, he went back inside. He was so powered in the spirit. Also, when they are pressing you, pressing you, pressing you, pressing you in the night, because you're not pressing in the place of prayer enough. <laughs> Pastor, I almost died. Why you will not pray? Why would they not press you? Every day, Baba Jim, Baba Jim, Baba Jim. Baba Jim, they are pushing. Masquerade is pushing. Masquerade is pushing. You cannot want to collect the, the thing. I'm busy, Masquerade. <laughs> Someone says your spirit husband. That's why you cannot have husband. They even came with children. They came with children. See your children. <laughs> it's time to pray. We are raising a group of prayerless Christians. Things are sneaking into your house. You are not praying. I told you when the enemy came for my wife. 
I told you the story. I tell you all the stories all the time. We back these things in the place of prayer. And stop looking for pastors up and down. It's time for you to build your own capacity. My phone number might not go. On the day of trouble. On the day of calamity, Satan can say, you know what, you demons, this game I want to call Pastor Philip. First go and disrupt MTN. Then you attack her. So how do you reach me? Someone say pray. pray. Say again, say pray. pray. Say it again, say pray. pray. The last thing is to build a routine around it. Let me hear with this. My time is gone. Build a routine around it. One, desire. I said to grow desire. You should do what? One, read books. Number two, Steps. Number three, attend meetings like this. Attend prayer meetings like this. To grow your desire. Number two, build a routine around it. Finally, build a routine around it. Everything starts with a routine, then grows into a beautiful relationship. Build a routine around it. I have a routine around my prayer life when I was starting. I didn't feel like praying when they bombed me. I didn't feel like praying. I don't always feel like praying. I build a routine around it. I don't pray because I have something to pray about. I pray because I need to pray. Are you following my point? Everything happens to be like a routine. Successful people have a routine. Everything successful has a routine. You don't give in to your flesh because you have a routine. Are you following my point? You put a knife on your own flesh. You put a rule to yourself and you submit yourself to that rule. I pray at social time every day to social time, period. I read this book every day until I finish it, period. I read, you put a routine. Don't stop looking for you to feel. You will not feel late. So I say, I say if you want to feel late, put a bullet in your pocket and feel late. You will not feel led to do it. You have to make yourself do it. You have to build a routine. Are you following my point? Yes, you are never going to get to a point in your life where you are just going to... No, it's going to start like a routine. Sometimes it might even be boring. One day the Lord told me, Philip, look at nature. Nature is routineous. Everything in nature is routineous. Look at nature. Look at the sun. Do you think the sun rises as it feels led? If I ask a believer, when do you pray? As I feel led. Do you think the sun rises every morning as it feels led? Do you think so? Yes. Answer me now. Yes, Some of you already have an appointment tomorrow. Now, why do you have an appointment tomorrow? Because you know that the sun will rise tomorrow morning. Is that not true? Yes, you already know. You say, I will see you tomorrow morning on Monday. Because you know that the sun will rise tomorrow morning. The sun does not rise as it feels late. It rises by routine. Look at weather. Hamatan. Rainy season. Sales, uh, dry season. They don't jump. Say, no, no, no. I feel late to come before Hamatan. I feel, no, nothing, nothing in nature is by, by, by being feeling like, nothing. Check everywhere. Check how plants grow. It's by routine. Everything can be predicted. Are you following my point? There's a predictable, you know, sequence of things in life. And that's how your prayer life should be. If you wait for you to feel led before you have a prayer life, you are not going to pray. So you know you pray by, don't go you that you cannot wake up by 6, don't say I pray by 3 a.m. You will not pray. Are you following me? You know you don't wake up by 6. Now that that's is by fire. So they have to pour water on our head. Jesus. Wake up. So if you want to put a routine prayer, you don't put a routine prayer by 3 a.m., it will not work. You start by 6.30. Because you know, as bad as it's bad, I will not wake up by that 6.15. So you put your prayer around 6.30. You put your prayer around 6 o'clock. Or you, you put it around when it can work. When you have done that, and you have done that for a while, you see that it begins to grow into a relationship that you begin to love. I didn't start my prayer life like this. I started by routine. No, I enjoy praying. I enjoy reading the Bible. One day my wife saw me reading the Bible and I was laughing. She said, why are you laughing? I said, if I share what's going on in my mind. You know, sometimes when I paint the scripture, you think I'm, I'm already painting my head and I'm laughing because it's funny to me. Like the story of Jacob. When Jacob sneaked into the house of Belia to go and sleep with her. So I pictured Jacob. You know that story of Jacob? How Jacob went and knocked the door. Belia. Belia. Because... This girl wasn't with that girl, Rachel. I told him that I'm going to sleep with my house girl. If I, if I can't have baby, go and sleep with my house girl. Because it's not, my it's not only my sister that will have children in this house. You, you, you must have children by my house girl. So they told the man of God, the great man of God, patriarch of faith, go and sleep with house girl. So I saw how the man of God. Because, you know, Billy House room was not very far from, uh, from the other lady, Leah. So he knocked. So you see, when I'm reading the Bible, I'm painting this picture in my head. And I'll say, hello, who is that? <laughs> say, is, is your guy, is your guy? 
So I saw, I saw how the man, he said, open the door, it's not locked. I saw how the man of God sneak into house gate. You know, say, I don't know whether your guy has told my well, madam. I don't know whether she has explained. So you say, yes, yeah. She has told me everything. Come, come and do what you want to do. I saw a man of God. I saw the embarrassment and the shame. So when I paint that picture in my head, I'm seeing it. I enjoy reading the Bible. I enjoy it. I don't have to. I enjoy, when I open it, I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I say, wow, this fool. You know, and come back and say, you know, that guy, that guy is just like you. And sometimes he's picking up my own there. I say, that's true, that's true. I write it down. I enjoy, but it did not start like that. When I first finished the Bible, I finished the Bible in four months. I told myself, I'm not going to read the Bible. I will read the Bible one hour before breakfast, one hour before lunch, one hour before dinner. Every day. I was waiting for jam results. So when I wake up in the morning, food is ready, the Bible is ready. I picked the Bible one hour. It's like French. Sometimes I'll say, yeah, I serve my food, I'll smell the food. Mm. Mm. One hour, I got up with. Sometimes I'm going to go two hours. I say, God, sorry, let me just sit. I'm about to die. I finished the entire Bible in four. Did I understand what I read? Nothing. Nothing. But I stayed there. Now, the same Bible now is food to me. Rise on your face. You are going to pray and say, Lord, steer in me a desire for prayer. Share in me 